Hey guys, uh, we'll get started in a minute. I see a few more people joining. Thanks for joining our live YouTube stream, the Cam Hangout with myself. I'm Al Watmo. And I'm CJ Abraham. Yeah. Today we are going to go through, or CJ is going to walk us through setting up a vice uh, for the purpose of Cam. And then the other thing that we wanted to do is make sure everybody knows that uh, we're watching the chat. So that's why there's two of us. I'll watch the chat and CJ will be demonstrating infusion. So if there's questions or you want to distract CJ along the way, uh, please go ahead and do that. We'd, we'd love the feedback. Uh, last week, there was some comments around uh, tips and tricks or tutorials for newer users. Um, so we did take that feedback and uh, we're looking into doing a live stream for that as well in the future. But in the meantime, CJ, can you show the help page uh, one of the guys on our team, Mike Matera, has done a, an excellent set of YouTube tutorial, tutorials for new users. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, they're not on YouTube, but I'll just show that web page. I think it'd be useful for folks that are uh, newer to CAM. Yeah, we should be looking at it right now. Perfect. Yeah, so this, this website has all sorts of tutorials, click-by-click -click stuff for everything that you might want to do inside of Fusion Manufacturing. It's a very good resource. There's even videos for each one. All right, so that's a, a great resource if you're new. Uh, but with that being said, CJ, why don't you take us through uh, how you'd get advice off of a, a web page of maybe a supplier? Yeah, so I'll just go through the whole process. Um, and I'm showing the end result of something that a user might want. And what I have is a self-centering vice. In this case, it's from Ling. We're actually going to work through a fifth axis vice uh, for the exercise. But uh, there's some nice things that we do when this is all put together. For example, if I open up the parameters, I can see that I have some user parameters for the stock size. So you can go in and you can start editing the sizes directly from here. I also have a joint origin in the middle of the stock that is a convenient place for positioning apart. In this case, the joint origin is on the same Z level as the top of the jaws. So then you could, you know, set a joint with an offset that is a, a nominal distance from the top of the jaws. Uh, so we're going to go through getting this set up, start to finish. And the intent here is to show hiccups along the way. I'm going to download a model from fifth axis, look at it, maybe have to reorganize the feature tree and things like that. This is really just meant to give an idea of how someone might go about this and prepare it on their own. And we're going to try and see those hiccups live to inspire a conversation. But if along the way you want to point out a hiccup that you've found, um, Let's try and stump CJ and, and see if we can't help you. Again, the point of this is to be a bit of a conversation. Uh, I understand we're the only ones that can talk, uh, but at least you can use the chat. And we'll, we'll answer the questions as we go. Yeah, I believe the, the name of the game is Stump the Chump. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to close this one, and I'm going to open up the Fifth Axis website here. So make my screen a little bigger. Okay, so here's the Fifth Axis website. Uh, I'm going to go to their product page, and I'm looking for uh, just one of their self-centering vices. So here's a list of all their products. Here's a self-centering vice section. Um, let's see what we have here. Looks like I need to click find device. Yep, here's their product page. Uh, they have some metric and inch versions. Uh, this V562 vice looks like a good choice. So I'm going to open up that. And I see a 2D and a 3D model here. So I'm going to download the 3D model. Okay, so now that's in my downloads. Okay, and I'm going to... Un so it's in my downloads folder. I'm not going to show my, my, full, my Windows Explorer. But I've got it unzipped in my downloads folder. And now I'll go back into Fusion. Okay, and I already have a part in this folder that we're using for this webinar here, but I'm going to, oh, of course, now I'm showing Windows Explorer. Okay, and I'm going to open that Parasolid file and upload it. Okay. 
and wait for that to translate. So it's translating it into a native Fusion 3D file now. And it's complete. CJ, it might not be bad to just talk through the options of uh, translation. In this case, what was the file type you translated? And uh, maybe for users that are new to Fusion, what types could they translate in? Uh, as far as I know, we can import any type of 3D CAD file uh, with the AnyCAD, AnyCAD technology that we have. Um, obviously, we just brought in Parasol, but any of the neutral 3D formats work. So Parasol, Step, I just... Uh, I would have a hard time naming all the file types that we can import off the top of my head. I'd have to look at a list. Okay. Uh, any comments in chat so far about, you know, our, our fixture choice? Anything like that? Uh, no comments of this particular fixture. There's a few other questions that I'm going to save until you've got through this, but uh, some questions around modeling stock. So that might have to be a future webinar. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So... We've got this imported now. Uh, there is no feature tree right now, or design. Uh, what do we call it? Let me look at look at the uh, de design on. history capture. So the first thing I'm going to want going to want to do is turn on capture design history, and that's what turns it into a parametric assembly, where I can start adding joints and things like that. If I leave it in this direct editing mode and I don't have uh, the design history at the bottom. This is just, uh, it's direct editing of bodies and things like that, which I, I don't want. So the first thing I'll do is right click, turn on capture design history. And at this point, I'm actually going to hide our faces so that you guys can see the design history as I'm going along here. So turn on file, turn off me. Now we're just looking at fusion. All right. So now that I've got design history turned on, I'm taking a look at the tree structure here and I notice that there's lots of components uh, there's no sub assemblies which is good uh, each one of those components does have a body so let's see if we can organize this a bit because all we really need is to separate this into three distinct components one is the base which is going to be fixed and then the two sliding jaws so let's take a look here that looks like it's going to be part of the base and I'm just going through and I'm highlighting component by component. Just making sure that I'm not selecting anything off of the jaws. Alternatively, you know, you can select things and control select off the feature tree, but you can also change selection filters. And I'm going to uncheck select all, and I'm going to turn on just components. And then I can drag select in the window, right? And if I drag from right to left, it captures everything that it touches. And in this case, it looks like it captured a little more than I wanted. So I'm going to control and click those objects there to unselect those bolts. Looks like there's some dowel pins in here that I don't want. And I'm hold selecting to click through and get to these pins. So I know there's a pin there that's selected. So I hold click until it shows me what I want. And I can unselect that. Okay, so I can pretty definitively say that this is all the stuff that I want to see in just the base. So I'm going to make a rigid group. Keep include child components turned on. And now, when I drag this out, you can see all those components, well, actually, left the, uh, the carriers in there. But all those components are now a rigid group. I'm just going to right-click and edit that rigid group and take out those jaw carriers there. Perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. And the way I'm getting this part to go back is right now it's asking me if I want to capture the position after I moved it. And I just hit revert and that brings it back to where it was. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing here where I take all of these components plus that carrier. I'm going to make that a rigid group. And I'm going to repeat that rigid group one more time. Let's try this again. Include that component there. OK, so now everything should be in a rigid group. OK, it looks like I missed those guys right there. Uh, 
Did I get those in there? I sure did. Okay. All right, so the next thing that I want to do is that now that I have my three distinct groups of components, I want to start adding motion in between each one. Uh, and the first type of motion is actually no motion at all. I want this base to be fixed in space. And if you're coming from a product like SolidWorks, your first reaction might be to ground. And we do have a ground uh, command, but this doesn't quite do what you might expect. What you really need to do is create an as-built joint and it's going to be an as-built joint between the base and the top level component uh, like the assembly container and that locks the two origins together which is really what is intended that way when I go to insert this fixture template into another cam component a design uh, design file it doesn't break all of the joints that I've been trying to apply inside of this template Okay, so now that I've got that as-built joint in there, if I click and drag, that base no longer moves, but I can still move these jaws. Okay, so that's working nicely. And next, I need to make slider joints for each of the jaws. So I'll do an as-built joint between that jaw and the base. Okay, that works. And I want to add slider motion, and I will select... All you need for the motion is to select an origin, and in this case, if I hover over the center of this nut, it gives me a nice origin in the middle of that. I get a preview of the slide. That makes sense. And I will do the same thing for the other side. Hey, CJ, can I interrupt you for a second? You sure can. Uh, there's, there's somebody just asking. You glossed over, and I think it was pretty important, why you didn't use ground um, in... You're being asked, can you just explain that a little bit more? Yeah, it's, wow, it's, it's actually a tough question to answer on the spot, but there's, there's a fundamental difference between an as-built joint rigid and ground. Uh, ground is useful when you're doing something like in-context design, and you need to move something that was otherwise free to move in space. So, for example, let's say I removed all of those joints and I had... Uh, these components free floating in space now. What I could do is I could save this position. Okay, so first of all, let me point out that I, I uh, rolled back my design history to do this. So I still got those joints that I applied earlier. So I've captured this position so I can move on my design history. I can move between these two positions here. And what I'll do now is I will ground the base Okay, and now I have a ground feature inside of this design history, and that's something that gets calculated as part of this design. So now I can't click and drag the base anymore, just like a, when we had the as-built rigid joint, but it doesn't do quite the same thing because now as part of my design history, I can unground, and you see I get another feature at the bottom here. So it's part of a calculation inside of a single document. If I then insert this document in, or insert this design into another document, that grounding is not part of the calculation inside of that other document. So things will be free floating even if you intend them to be fixed. And that's why I'm using an as-built rigid joint. I think that's perfect. And maybe at the very end we could we could go back and do one wrong and show show what's happened. But at least now, if you put a vice in and it's not working correctly, uh, it might be that immediate reaction. Oh, I used ground instead of as built. Yeah. But thank you for taking that distraction. That was a great question. I, I like to tell people, if you're wondering something, there's probably 5,000 other people that are wondering the same thing, even if it seems like a silly question. So please ask, uh, not just on behalf of you, but the 5,000 other people that are forgetting the same thing that, that you're missing. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. That was a great question. Okay, so we were at before is now I've applied my three joints that I want, so the rigid and the two sliders. So now these two jaws are sliding. And because this is a self-centering vise, I need to link the motion between those two sliding joints. So I'm going to expand the joint section here, and you can see I have my two sliders. And I will look for motion link. So under assemble, there's a command motion link. I can select the two joints. And you can see a preview of the intent here. 
if the jaws were not moving in the correct orientation, like say they're moving like this, there is a reverse checkbox where you can change the result. And because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, as long as the distance values are the same, you'll get a one-to-one -one ratio there. And now when I move these two, or when I move one jaw, the other moves with it. Okay, so I would say that this vice is now fully defined, right? It has all the motion that I want. It's it's fixed on the origin, things like that. In fact, I didn't take the time to make sure that it was on the origin even. So now that I turn on the origin, I, I just realized it's not on the origin at all. But we can fix that. Even with all the stuff that we've done, we can roll it back. And those are all rigid now. Well, let's see. Hmm. This is something of a predicament now. Uh, I can move everything. So if I roll it back, we were in this position here, right, where everything was free-floating. But I need to move this base component onto the origin, yet still keep the joints. If I just did that now, uh, with with the as-built joints the way they are, my jaws would actually stay in the same place that they are now. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to roll back to before. Oh, let's see. Oh, no, this will still work. Okay. So I can I think select... a lot of people are having fun watching an expert struggle for a minute. And, and just talking through how you think about solving the problem is super useful. So the, the, Well, this is through. exactly how the real world is, right? When you're setting this stuff up. So... Yeah, I realized that I can take my rigid, uh, my rigid groups here, and I can move those using a point to point. Okay, so I've started a move command. I've selected the three components that I know were in the rigid groups. Uh, I'm going to do a point to point move. So I want to take that point right there, and you can see when I hover over this face, maybe it's a little faint on screen, but if I hold Control, I can then select this point that's in the center of the the hole here. So I'll select that. And then I'll select the origin, and it should just move everything. Crossing my fingers here, and it did. Okay, so that's exactly what I wanted. I can hit OK. And then because of the way as-built joints work, everything should just work. And unfortunately, it did not. Was that because I didn't capture my position? It's because I didn't capture position. So I'll capture position, then I'll roll everything forward. Now everything's where I want it to be. Incredible. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people in the chat excited that uh, a professional like you uh, struggles sometimes and just watching how you I think it's important anytime this sort of thing happens. Is how do you just calmly take a step back and say, OK, what did I do uh, and work yourself through the problem? And the better you understand how the software solution works, the easier it is to, to realize where you made a mistake. Yeah, and, and this is how it is for any, every time I look at another vendor, every vice I do is case by case. So sometimes it just takes knowing what tools you have available to you to get the result that you want. Uh, so I'm happy with the way everything is set up in here. Now I want to apply uh, stock to this model, right? So I'm going to put in a stock body. First, I'll start with a component. Rule number one, start with a component. But I'll put a component uh, in there for the stock. Rule number one is to hit save, as some of the users are pointing out. OK, save. <laughs> save. OK, so now that I've got my saved uh, self-stuttering vice, I'll add a component. So I click new component. I'll call this the stock. OK, so now I have an empty stock component that is now activated. And I'm going to do something that might not make perfect sense, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I'm going to isolate the stock component, so I'm not showing anything now. And I'm going to activate the origin in the stock component. Not the origin on, on the top level assembly, but the origin that's in the stock component. And I'm going to start drawing my stock from here. So I'll start a sketch there. I'll do a center rectangle. Uh, I'm going to type in some values that are apparently two meters. Apparently, I'm in meters right now, which is weird. Let's fix that. 
What's two inches in meters? <laughs> okay, so I'll go up to document settings and change my units. Inch. Maybe that's a hub level uh, setting because I'm in a new hub. Curious. Anyway, I've got my cube, but I want to uh, use parameters, user parameters to change the size of the stock whenever I want. So I'll go up to user parameters. And I'll add a few in here, so I'll click the plus, add one for stock X. Make sure it's not in meters. Stock Y, call that one two as well. And stock Z. Okay, so I've got my user parameters. For X and Y, I'm going to go back into the sketch and modify these dimensions. If only I could. Why? Hmm. That's sort of a problem. Let's just delete those and make a new one. We're all having so much fun watching you have problems, CJ. I'm glad everyone is uh, relishing in my torture. What is wrong here? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? I can't make a sketch. Um, so the funny thing is I'm seeing, uh, because we're both in two different places, even though we've showed you both in the video together, that's just the advancements in technology. Yeah, Alice seeing uh, a delay. I'm seeing the same delay everybody else is. I seem to be in a situation where I can't actually start a sketch in that component. Weirdest thing. Who are those people that were telling me to save? That's a good idea, because I'm going to close and reopen this document. Yeah, let's give that a try. And again, you're having plenty of people saying it, feel, it makes them feel so much better. And I think <laughs> the, the interesting thing is I wish I could be right there to see it live and help you through it, and I can't. But what I can say is generally speaking, when problem solving happens, you need to just slow down for a minute. In CJ's case, he's like, oh, no, I'm on YouTube Live. Uh, and, and your brain just doesn't think quite as clearly. And I think it's the same thing when you're in a shop on Friday night trying to get home uh, and you run into something that may or may not actually be wrong. Um, but because you make a mistake along the way, uh, you stop thinking uh, perfectly clearly uh, and it, uh, it creates a little bit of extra pressure. So don't worry, CJ, just kind of slow down and let's, let's talk through this one uh, together um, yeah. and let everybody learn from, from what's going on. Okay. So I managed to start a sketch and this might be a bug that I need to report, but there was no create sketch button on my right click menu, but I could access the sketch tools, which forces me into sketch mode. So I'm just going to roll with it. Uh, so we have, instead of typing in numbers now, I can type in stock X and stock Y. Okay, so that's great. I can then extrude this, and instead of typing in a number, I can say stock Z. Excellent. And then I will activate the top level component here, show all components. And it looks like the, the stock is kind of buried in the vise, right? But that's because I drew the stock on the original origin. I can drag it out here and now we're looking at the good part. And I drug it out here and then I captured the position. And sometimes I capture position on purpose knowing, knowing I'm going to delete it later. And now we're going to drop a couple of joint origins onto these jaws. And first, I'm going to measure a couple of things. So if I look at the side profile of these jaws, they're designed for dovetails. So they have all these different little features in them, right? And so I need to be able to get the corner of the, the stock here touching this face and this face at the same time. 
So I'm going to measure the distance here, and it looks like that's 100 thou. And also the distance between the top of the jaws there and that edge, and that looks like it's a bit more. So it's 120 thousandths. Okay. So drop in a joint origin here, and then I can raise this up. 120 and set it in minus 100. Or I'm sorry, that's not what I wanted to do at all. I just need the distance from this chamfer here, which is this a very strange number. You'll see this come up, Al, on the stream in a second. I made a little loopsy. It's okay. I'd, I'd suggest maybe slow down just a hair. And then also the other thing you want to make sure is when you're looking at these models from vendors, and it's an intelligent thing vendors do, they're often going to take numbers that are irrelevant for the purpose of how you're going to use this vice and cam, uh, but make them just a little less manufacturable uh, just to help kind of protect themselves a little bit and take the tolerance out of their models. Um, so oftentimes you'll see some funny numbers. I had a vendor tell me uh, some funny things about the size he made certain holes uh, just to kind of get a kick out of things when he shared his models publicly. So you got to keep an eye out for that. I'd rest assured the important surfaces are in the right spots, but some of the less important geometries uh, may be made up or adjusted numbers just to make uh, somebody copying the model and reproducing it a little more difficult. Right. So now I've got my joint origin here, and it's exactly where I need it to be. When I put the stock in, which has a 90-degree angle, um, in this area where it's supposed to be a dovetail, it'll... It'll fit exactly where it needs to go. And I believe because it, when we imported the model, it knew that those two components were the same component mirrored. It's two, it's two instances of the same jaw. And when I added that joint origin, it added it to both jaws. So I only had to put it in once. That's kind of a neat thing about joint origins is that when you add one, even if you add it at the top level, it'll go to the lowest component level and stick it in there. In fact, I should show that on the feature tree here. Okay, and so now... DJ, ahead, just do me a favor. There's some comments and it's, it's a very valid comment. If you just slow down with your mouse just a little bit and bef explain what you're going to do before you do the click instead of after. That way, uh, sometimes you do the click and then somebody uh, catches up with the explanation. So... Yeah. Just okay. sort of explain what you're going to do just before you do it. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is uh, put joints between the stock and the jaws with my new joint origins. So I'm going to select the joint command. And it looks like we have the new joint command where we have the positional uh, settings and then the motion settings on a different tab. So first I will select a position on the stock and then the joint origin that I just made on one of these jaws. And I'm going to make that one a rigid joint, so I don't need to add any motion, right? In fact, I have to go over the motion and make sure it's rigid first. And the next one, because these, self, these jaws are self-centering, if I make the next joint also rigid, that technically over-defines the assembly. So let's demonstrate that. I'll select a joint on one side, select the joint origin I made on the jaws there. And if I make this rigid and click OK, let's see if I compute all and it results in some sort of, oh, it looks like it didn't. OK. I guess that would, in a previous update, that would have resulted in some sort of yellow error where it wouldn't have broken the model, but it would have given you a warning that it was overdefined. If you run into that, the trick that I was trying to get at was that you can select joints like that and then make them planar. And then you just leave one of the uh, one of the planes as an axis of freedom of motion, and then it alleviates that over constraint. But in this case, it looks like it was okay. Okay, so now we have our self-centering vise. We have stock. If I go into the parameters again, and change something like the Y parameter, the jaw should get larger. 
right? And in this case, you know, I made the, the stock four inches in Y and it pushed the jaws out past the vise. So you could use the same process for reversing the vise jaws. You could put joint origins on the other side of the vise and, and rejoin it that way if you want. But this is working the way that I've intended for it to. And let's take a look at how I would use this in a manufacturing assembly. So I'm going to open up a part here. I don't know that this part is actually going to fit in the stock range of this vise, but it at least demonstrates that you can insert it into different designs. Okay, And this actually works out nicely as a manufacturing assembly because despite having the full heat feature tree in this document, this um, the part we're making is represented as a component. And let me just make sure it's fixed. It's not fixed. So the first thing I'm getting, going to do is fix that component in space again using an as-built joint. So as-built between that component and the top level, it's going to be rigid. Okay, so now that's fixed. And then I'm going to right-click and insert into current design, or you can drag and drop into the current design. And when you insert into a current design, you get your one free move. So you can place it, rotate it however you want. And it's kind of like an in-place capture position. Okay. And actually, there's one thing I forgot to do is add my special little joint origin for being above the jaws. So back in the original document, I'm going to add another joint origin. I'm going to place it on the bottom center of the stock right here and offset that in Z. I happen to know that the distance was minus 100 thousandths. So now that joint origin might be a little bit hard to see, but it's 100 thousandths off the bottom of the stock, which is the same as the top of the jaws here. Well, I just realized why I couldn't make a sketch earlier. It just oh, dawned yeah, on me. That? It's because I didn't set my selection filters back to select all. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we can all learn together and it was fun to hear you laugh at yourself. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> um, another thing I'm gonna do here is change the opacity of the stock. So I want it to be semi-transparent. So I'll right click, change the opacity control to 50%. And I like the way that looks. So I'll hit save. Was anybody yelling at me at yelling at me to save yet? I got, I got uh, no, this far. No uh, yells to save yet, but uh, people are starting to laugh at you realizing uh, what you've done. How many people knew what it was before I found out? I'm curious. I, to, did, I'm curious I didn't to know. see the answers in the comments, to be honest. So yeah. there was uh, over 100 of, us, 100 of us all in this together with you, CJ. Amazing. All right. So now I've saved the other document with the changes that I've made. I've updated the component that I've inserted into this design. And now I'm going to do something that makes this really special is I'm going to break the link. Okay. So I'm going to right click, break link. And what this does is now the entire design history that we just made in that other document now exists inside of this document. And again, the link is broken. So if I go back to the other assembly make changes, they, they won't show up here. I have to make them in this assembly. But this also means that the parameters came over. So there's some existing parameters in this document already, but you can see that the stock X, Y, and Z parameters are now carried over. So that's really handy. Let's go ahead and join these parts together. Let's see if I can find something useful here. So it seems like I, I want to join this to the bottom of the part, but there isn't a nice joint origin that's just in the center of the whole part, right? I can select, highlight this face and I get this joint origin, but that's not in the center of the part. Same thing on the other side. So I'm going to try something. I have an idea. And I've never done it before, so I'm going to do it for the first time live and see what happens. This can't go wrong at all. Uh, I'm going to create a sketch now that I actually can, and I'm going Hopefully. to I'm going to project 
And with this selection filter, I'm going to select the body. So I'm going to project the silhouette of the component. Okay, so that projected the silhouette of the component on the bottom face. And now if I go to surface and select patch, I can patch that sketch. And now I have a face where if I go back to my assemble tools, I should be able to create a joint. No, how about a join origin? I can create a join origin, there we go. So special trick to get a joint origin in the centroid of a part where you don't have one before, you can project the silhouette of the body onto a plane, then you can patch that sketch and create a joint origin in the middle of it. That was a cool live trick, CJ. The more you know. Okay, so now that I've got those two, Use that join origin, that join origin. Now I know that these two are set in a way that the bottom of the component right now is right on the top of the jaw. So I'm going to add a little bit more. So let's say I want to add an eighth of an inch. So I'll go minus 125,000. Okay, that looks pretty good. Uh, I can make the stock a different size here. If I leave the uh, window open, should live update, yeah. So maybe three and a half there. That looks pretty good. Maybe for Z, we can do two inches look fine. What do I need for Y? Let's do two for Y. How about two and a half? Nailed it. Cool. And, and that's it. From here, you would do your normal setup process where you would Go into setup, you would select the model. So in this case, you want that body there. Stock, you say from solid. So you go over the stock tab, click the drop down, click from solid, and then you can choose the stock component. And for the origin, I'm gonna change the orientation to ZX. So you can select a face to be normal to on Z, as a face to be normal to on X. For the origin, I want to use selected point, and I'm gonna open up the feature tree here all the way down to my fixture and I'm going to select the origin of that fixture because I positioned it earlier the way I wanted it to and now it drops into the bottom center of that vise. So with some upfront work you can make the setup process, the process of setting up a setup really easy. And then what some users actually do is that you can create a, a template assembly and you've predefined what the fixture is and you've predefined what the stock is. Um, you could even predefine a component that's your model and drop your model into that predefined component. Yeah, so in this case, um, I've done the reverse of what you've just described where I inserted a fixture template into a where a component was but yes you can do it the other way around where you can insert a component into a assembly file where all of this is defined already and you could have templates already set up with operate you can have whole operations whole setups with operations already set up and all you do is drop in a component and it starts recalculating toolpaths good so uh did you save this on, by the way okay uh oh my face is coming back did you um, did you walk through where you think you should save the part? Maybe while you're doing that, it'd also be good to show everybody. Uh, a lot of these models have been done already in CAM samples, so maybe show CAM samples, uh, and then also uh, also show uh, how you would save this so you can reuse it later. Okay. So in CAM samples and work holding. We have added a bunch of uh, products from companies that have work holding products like Mighty Byte, Pearson Work Holding, Orange Vice, uh, Fifth Axis, all these guys are in there. Uh, some of them have some joints set up ready for you to use. Others you might need to set up on your own. Uh, if I were to save this to use it later, uh, the way I've done it, for this live stream, it's already saved. It was an inherent 
it was inherently saved from the way I've done it, right? It's its, its own document, and I can save it this way. Um, I guess you could have, uh, you could make a project where all that project contains is work holding components, right? Now that we have cross project references. So as long as you're part of both projects, you would be able to insert into current design a work holding document from another project that is strictly for work holding. That's, and I would take it a step works. further too, is um, if you're doing something with like a, this was, this was useful in a part in, in advice, but if it's something where it's a, the piece of stock has got a dovetail prep on the bottom side of it, uh, then your, uh, your template assembly, if you will, and again, that's just a normal fusion document that you're using, reusing that, that document could have the tool pads in it to produce the dovetail feature. And when you adjust the size of the stock, you get updated tool pads for uh, doing your stock prep. So yeah, let's see if we can do that on the fly real quick, because if I just add, so I'm already in the design, if I add an empty component and let's call this, uh, let's call this part. You know, if you're going to do it on the fly, why don't you go to cam samples and pull out uh, one of the sample dovetail fixtures? Could you do that? I suppose. If you're trying to stump me, yeah. I'm trying to stump you. Let's see what we got. We, we've learned a lot from you being stumped so far, so yeah. why don't we do it again? Okay, so we've got all these guys. Um, I'm going to save and close these out. Uh, I'll save that one too. Starting fresh. So first, let's pick out what dovetail fixture we want to use. Uh, I think this one looks pretty good. Let's just verify. Yeah, let's give this one a try. So I'm going to save as in our project. So we are in webinar hangouts. Today's the third. Okay, so that'll be good there. Uh, let's see, this should be a three quarter. Yeah, so that's a three quarter inch dovetail. Let's also open this guy. And I'm gonna save, I'm, I'm saving the files that I know I'm going to need into the project because cam samples is read only. Otherwise I wouldn't need to do this. Okay, so I've got my fixture components there. Let's insert this. These stock files are uh, prepped files that already have the correct geometry from Raptor. So all you need to do is join them in. Uh, in this case, I don't have the joints and all the origins all set up. So what I need to do is make the joints behave like mates. All right, so I know that needs to end up on that side there. So I'm going to make a planar joint between this face and this face. Actually, I take that back. I need to do it on the other side. Oh, I don't have... Oh. Hmm. Did I stump you again? Yeah. Um, I have an idea. It's, it's because I want these to work like mates and I'm trying to rationalize how to make that work. So first, let's do this. I need this face out here. This face here. Okay. And I need that to be planar. Yeah, okay, that works. I need to center this thing up. So I'm going to make a joint here. So that's the top center of the jaws. And then I can do the top center of, or the bottom center of the vise. It says that there's a joint between these two components already, but I'm going to say yes. Okay, and I don't need it to be a planer. I want it to be a slider. And that should give me something that looks like that, right? Boom. That worked nicely. Yeah, that's fixed in space. I can't move that because I actually don't have design history turned on. Darn it. 
we get to learn from more of your mistakes. Yeah. So what's rule number two? Is that, does that turn on design history? It can be on by default. It's just uh, based on the document you're opening. It may be set yeah. differently. So anyway, I've got the dovetail fixture in here now, mostly. It's close enough. Okay, and I'm going to make break the link of that stock first of all, and I'm going to make it opaque. Okay, now I can create a new component. I'll call this part. All right, so I've got an empty part component now. Sorry if I'm going through this too quick. Create an as-built joint between the part and the top level, make that rigid so that it doesn't move. And there's nothing wiggling on screen because there's no geometry in the part to wiggle. You, can't, you won't be able to preview it, but it's there, I promise. Okay, and if we wanted to insert a part now, I would take... Let's find another sample part. Well, actually, first, let, let's put some toolpaths in here first. That way, people can see the magic of what we're trying to explain. Yep. We'll create a setup here. Yep, that's already all in the right place. OK, so this is where things get weird. I'm going to select a model, but the model is going to be this empty part component that we just made right here, right? So nothing in it. Change the stock to from a solid, select that guy right there. So now we have a setup that has a part with an empty component. And I'm going to add a 3D adaptive clearing toolpath. Let's just add any, I'm not using the new, new tool preview right now. I didn't think to turn that on just before this. Uh, let's use a half inch flat end mill. Top must be above the bottom. So it doesn't have a mo let's let's do let's do from selection. So I'll say say fifty thousand, no surface has been selected. Whoops, what is going on? Oh model surfaces. There's there's really no model in here. Okay, so I, I think the guys that are doing this are doing, they're making toolpaths with something in it, and then before you have a chance to cause these errors, they delete the model, and then when they reinsert something back in, yep. then it works. Yep. So let's just go ahead and try that. Um, let's insert your empty, your empty blank model part could just be a square block. Yeah, totally. That's a good point. Again, don't no need to rush. I think as you're working through this, just explain what you're doing because every little thing you do could be a tip or a trick for one of the users. Okay, so there's my cube. I made that at lightning speed, <laughs> and I will insert that. First, let's save it as a cube. Wait till it finishes saving and get the little blue ring. Okay. So we're going to insert that. Make a joint. I'm not too worried about what it actually looks like right now. I just want to be able to apply a toolpath. So let's, let's scoot that down a little bit. Let's do minus 50 thousandths. I should be able to change the extrude distance. Oh, it's the sketch. Okay. So let's make that three inches tall. Why not? Easy. Whose origin is this? It's the cube. Okay. Oh, and I can't turn it off because it's in the, uh, the document here. So if you insert into a current design and you're trying to turn on and off, the origin planes and axes, you actually had to do that in the source document and then update it before it'll go away. So if anyone's been struggling with that, that's why. Oh, and 
and I forgot to do one more thing. It's very important that this cube be in the part component, right? So I'm I'm rearranging the hierarchy so that there's a subassembly inside of this assembly that contains this cube component. Very important. Because now it recognizes that because we selected an empty part before, it recognizes that, that there is indeed geometry in there. So now I can add in that 3D adaptive strategy. And I'm just going to use the default settings. I'm not worried about getting a, a nice toolpath at this time. OK, so there's our toolpath. And let's save this. Go back to design and delete the cube. Be gone. Can we do that? Delete. There we go. OK. So by doing that, I can actually now insert a different component. So let's draw a cylinder instead. So create sketch. And I can create a cylinder. I hope this is interesting for people, by the way. I, I love associativity and trying to think about how I can make the computer do my job for me. And this is a great way of when you understand the relationships and how you're setting up associativity, you can really uh, use the product to, to optimize your process. And what's interesting here is the adaptive toolpath is the only toolpath that CJ created in this whole video. We're really showing how the associativity of the modeling environment is what we're leveraging. Right. Okay. So, drum roll, please. Let's get this arranged in a sensible direction and join it. Let's make sure that's rigid. OK, so we have our component in there. I'm going to rearrange the hierarchy. So I'm going to put the cylinder in the part and recalculate. Hey. It worked, by the way, Al. I know oh, it's going to be a few seconds before it works for you. Uh, it a few seconds before I see it. So I think what, what this is really showing is when you can create those relationships and then you can define toolpaths implicitly instead of explicitly. And those were words that went over my head as a machinist for a while, so I'll explain them. Uh, the implicit selections are most of your 2D machining operations where you're selecting geometry to define the toolpath. Well, that means you need to reselect that same geometry later, whereas the 3D toolpaths are implicit. You're setting uh, a solid and you can point it to a different solid to recalculate. You'll see us continue to do more things like this for automation. It's how most of turning works and what makes turning automatable. Uh, but also things like drilling. There's some implicit selections where you can say, I want to select the quarter inch holes. And by doing that, then when you put a different model in, it can recalculate. Uh, we're, we're trying even more things that I can't share now. But just think of this way of, if I can define my intent for my selection without picking something, then you can use workflows like this to automate your process. Lots of cools, lots of wows. I think people enjoyed that, CJ. The, awesome. the part you didn't show, um, people want to see you simulate the toolpath. Um, the other thing that I was hoping you would show that we didn't show is you can also, in this assembly, put all of the toolpaths on that dovetail to prep the dovetail. So in CJ's earlier workflow, he changed the size of the stock. Um, and in this case, it's a piece of dovetail stock. So you change the size of the stock and you have all those prep toolpaths ready to go. You don't need to recreate them because those would be largely driven off of selections. Features. Yeah, conceivably, this assembly could have, like you said, I changed the size of the stock here. I can make it wider in the design. But conceivably, you could have a setup in here that is for making this dovetail. And all you have oh, to do is... Oh, that's what I wanted simulation. You crashed it. <laughs> no. Yeah, so... It can, and actually, I could regenerate this toolpath now, too, yeah. right? Because that would regenerate Sorry, I saw you crash 15 seconds late. Well, tool's too short. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can make a uh, dovetail prep setup and you insert your part, you update your stock size, it updates your dovetail program, you hit post and you go prep your dovetail. Um, See, so Joe, there's a question based on one of my comments about having to choose for the select quarter inch holes. No, you don't. Uh, that's part of the base uh, 
drilling operation. So can you open, I think in cam samples, we've got a good demo file for some of the implicit selections. Uh, could you show that? No, uh, what are you trying to demo? Uh, the different ways to implicitly select holes. So you remember in the drilling operation, you can say, pick yeah, all the holes that are quarter inch, pick all the holes that start at the same Z face or the same depth. Those are some implicit selections and it's not part of the extension. Yeah, uh, do can... we have, so I'm trying to look for the model. If not, you could just draw one block with quarter inch holes in it and then another block later with quarter inch holes and copy and paste the tool paths. It'd be a, another yeah. way to show it. I think we used to have, or we have a really good one, but I think it's in our dev build Yeah. because we used it for testing. I'll just draw one. Yeah. Or anything. I mean, anything with some holes in it, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you for the tangent, by the way, about this uh, whole automation. I think it's cool. all of these sorts of things are important when you're trying to automate your processes. How do you do things uh, where later you don't have to have a click and you've actually captured your intent without making a selection? It means that it's going to be far more uh, so automatable or set up for automation. Automatable. Is that in the dictionary? Nope. That's why I stuttered halfway through, but it was live and I already started saying it. So <laughs> not that I can do about it now. I'm committed. I'm committed. You made mistakes. I have to make some mistakes on this thing too, CJ. Yeah. Okay. So at least here we have two steps and then I can do some stuff where, and let's say we put some quarter inch holes in. I, I'm doing this with no rhyme or reason other than I want four holes, two levels, and different depths, right? So let's say that these ones, are that depth, yeah, okay. I'll do the same thing here. Okay, so the intent here is that I have four holes. The ones on that level start at different, or end at different depths, and also these holes up here end at different depths. Yeah, okay. So if I do a wireframe view of this, make sense? Yep. Okay. So let's take a look at, I'm going to shade this thing again. Blow through making a setup here. All right. So they're quarter inch holes. Select a quarter inch drill. Maybe if I type it in one quarter. Yeah, quarter inch drill. Okay, so I didn't have to select a quarter inch drill in order for this to work. What's important is that I select a face. And if I turn on, and this is where things get interesting. This just happens to be a selection, but I can turn on select same diameter. And it's supposed to find all the same diameter holes. Um, I don't know what to tell you there. Well, uh, when it's doing that, there's a there's a couple of questions. We're getting close to the top of the hour. So uh, bring the comments in, in in regards to what you want to see us to cover. It sounds like there's some rallying around covering turning next week. So so I think, oh. uh, I think we'll do that. So give your comments. Uh, there was also a question from... I know what I did wrong. Uh, Sorry. Okay, I'll let you explain what you did wrong then. I didn't dimension the holes. <laughs> Oh, so they weren't actually a quarter inch. No. <laughs> Oops. That's important. Um, uh, so while CJ is fixing that, uh, I'm going to answer the question live about parametrics. Great, but what happens if the design changes in the middle of tool pathing? This is where document separation is super important. In some cases, you want that close association. If the modeling that you've done is for the purpose of manufacturing, then having it together in one document makes sense because you'll move over to the modeling space and you'll do some containment sketches and, and you want that close link. In other cases, the modeling was for the purpose of design and you want some separation, uh, in which case you should derive out a document from your design into a fresh fusion document to use for manufacturing. Uh, and then you can start your manufacturing on that. And then that way, you can choose whether or not you want to consume the design updates. Uh, Fusion even has something that we call milestones. Uh, so you can actually state that 
in your manufacturing document, you're using milestone two. And if the designer continues to revision the design, you don't have to be consuming it. So again, to sort of say it a different way, I believe that if you build a tool that connects everything together and you have that associativity, it's really easy to put doorways in place to stop the associativity from happening. But when you have a broken tool where design and manufacturing aren't connected, it's really hard to create a connection later. Uh, so really just look for the places and continue to push us on making sure we introduce the right gates if, if you have a need to um, stop the associativity from doing what it's doing, because there is some good reasons for not one. Yeah. So now that the select same diameter checkbox is working because I properly dimensioned the holes, uh, I can demo that. So if you select one hole, you get your one hole. If you turn on select same diameter, it finds all the holes that were the same size, regardless of where they start and where they end. And you notice I get four distinct drilling instances here. This would result in four can cycles from the post processor. Uh, I can turn on only same Z top height. So it'll only find holes that started at the same plane as the hole that I selected. So I can select that hole, it selects the top ones. I could select one down here, it just selects those two. Uh, the other option is that it only finds the same depth. Uh, I don't have any holes here that go the same depth, but it can find any holes starting on any plane that go, for example, half inch deep. And then you can have a combination of the two. So you can say only find holes that are going to this depth that start from this face. Uh, and that's just for selections. You could also have diameter range. So you can say find all holes that are between 245 and 265. And it'll find all the holes. This could be real. I just found this out the other day from another one of our uh, employees, but they were writing this really clever expression for these diameters. And what he was doing was making a spot drill and tap uh, template where what it does is uh, right now, if you want to tap and or a drill and tap, you for a quarter 20, you use a number seven drill, so 201 and a quarter inch tap. Well, to select those, uh, you basically get one or the other, right? You have to either say, well, I'm targeting quarter inch holes or I'm targeting 201 holes, but not necessarily both. So I thought this was genius. He wrote the expression that is the formula for determining the minor diameter drill in this range. So what that means is that if you write a range in here, even if the range is, um, even if you select a tool that's a quarter inch, it'll find holes that are 201 based off the formula. That's, that's cool. We can do that in another video. That's really worth talking about because you can create these super powerful templates where it looks like automation, but it's very targeted. Yeah. All right. So I think we're getting close to the top of the hour. I'll answer a couple of questions that I see just live. They're completely unrelated. You don't need to demo it at all. Okay. Um, CJ, if maybe you can uh, load up the post processor web page. One of the questions yeah. is in regards to post processing. Uh, I'm going to have CJ show it on the web page, but just know that in the product, when you go to add a post processor to a machine, it's looking at the same data source, and, and we're updating that uh, quite regularly. Um, the, the big thing to look for when you're looking for a post is first and foremost what your controller is. Uh, in this particular case, you're asking about a Gerber Saber 408. I, I don't know what control is on that machine, uh, frankly, uh, but you want to try and find out what the control is. Most often machines have a common uh, controller and start with uh, start with digging uh, digging through the post library to find the control. How's that? Is this pronounced Gerbil? I, I, I didn't quite hear what the controller name was, but there happens uh, to be a post a, that is closed. No, it's not Gerbil. It's okay. a Gerber Saber. Yeah, it looks like it's a router. Do we... There's some Saber posts. Um, I'm again, I'm not perfectly uh, familiar with that shop machine. Saber? Here's a shop Saber post. One CNC. Yeah. That's something. Yeah, it's not might, nothing. Might might be it. It's a good good place to start. And if you're not there, certainly go to the forums. It's a pretty active community that'll help you out with that. So. Uh, go to the post processor form and, and we'll be more than happy to help you. Um, so CJ, I'm also seeing a comment that in the future we should talk about expressions. Uh, absolutely agree. 
Uh, and then also there's some questions around nesting. We're making some great progress on nesting. I can't give timelines, especially on a live YouTube. Um, but as we get closer uh, to that being something that you should all be using, we'll certainly set up a webinar to walk through, uh, walk through that. I did see a question in regards to five axis machine simulation. We're absolutely aware of the need. I'm speaking on behalf of the product management team here. Uh, we are, uh, but it's not in the product right now, no. That said, Autodesk has plenty of products that do it. And as we fuse all of our technologies together, it's, it's safe to assume that we'll, we'll work on that. But again, no timelines. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're past, the, we're past time. We so are past time. Uh, the comments seemed like people enjoyed this. Uh, it was fun for us. I certainly enjoy being on an airplane a little less and taking some time to do this. So I hope everybody's doing well through the world events. Cheers. Awesome.